I think uh, we're pretty much good to get started now. I, I want to um, welcome everybody and thank you for um, joining us today. Uh, today's webinar, we're going to be talking about the open access and um, the open access plan at the National Institutes for Health. And uh, in particular, how to respond to requests for information when these draft policies come out. So we'll be giving a little bit of a history of, of um, what's been going on in the US federal government around these proposed policies, a little bit of the timeline and what to expect over the next couple of years for that, and, um, and how you can get involved in advocacy yourself. And joining me today, we're very happy to have Katie Steen uh, James from Spark. The uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I just missed it just a moment ago. But the manager of public policy and advocacy for Spark, and um, Katie's been involved with, uh, you know, in particular a lot of these uh, policy changes at the federal government, responding to what uh, uh, the federal agencies have been planning to do, and has been a strong advocate for open science for open access and open science for, for years now. Um, and so Katie, thank you for joining us today and for presenting with us. Excited to be here. Thanks, David. Uh, so let the outline for today, I'm going to give a little bit of a brief history of what the proposed policies have looked like over the past few years, a little bit of a timeline. I'll be then passing it to Katie to talk about um, uh, what's in store with the draft plan and what uh, Spark's perspective and opinion is on what these uh, draft policies look like and how they can be perhaps uh, changed or improved. Um, and she'll also be providing some examples uh, at the end of what uh, uh, information they've supplied to NIH uh, based on the draft policies that are coming out. I'll be then giving a little bit of opinion about what the Center for Open Science is advocating for in these regards. And I'll go through the step-by-step -step process of what it takes to respond to these. Um, and in particular, the, the take-home message that I'd like to leave everyone with today, and I'll repeat it at the end. Um, the last time an RFI came out, there were 146 responses uh, to the NH draft policy. Um, and that really shows that there's ample opportunity to have your opinion and have your voice heard in this process. And it doesn't take too much time. It doesn't take too much effort, um, especially if you have an opinion that you uh, want to share. There's a straightforward process to doing that. And sort of together, we can make sure our voices are are heard. Um, and we encourage everybody part to participate to consider doing that. But we'll we'll go through that at the end. I like to start every webinar and presentation just with a little bit about uh, the Center for Open Science and what we do and, and how we're supported. Uh, so uh, the Center for Open Science is a mission-driven nonprofit organization. Our mission is to increase the trust and credibility of scientific research through transparency and through improving um, reproducibility of empirical research findings. And we're generously supported by uh, both public and uh, private donors, and all of the information about our funding is available online. All right, this gets us to the uh, topic of today's conversation about the Office of Science and Technology Policy. This is uh, an office in the um, executive wing of the U.S. federal government that uh, influences and connects the uh, all of the scientific research that's conducted by or supported by the U.S. federal government. Um, and this office in 2022 came out with what's called the Nelson Memo. Um, Alondra Nelson uh, was the um, acting chair at that uh, point in time. And we'll go over the, a couple of um, big points from the Nelson Memo, but the uh, big picture decision, the big picture move that happened at this time was that um, by the end of 2025, research that's conducted with federal dollars 
um, needs to be openly available. You need to be able to read the results without having to have a subscription to uh, uh, a journal. And you need to be able to get to the underlying data and the, and the uh, meat of the research uh, as much as that is you know, ethically and, and logistically feasible to do so. And very importantly, it needs to be available right away. So uh, no more of these shenanigans around em embargoes that may or may not uh, ever get lifted. So it was, it was a big sea change for how uh, we expect science to be conducted. It sort of shifts the, the norm from um, as paywalled or, or, or opaque as, as is standard towards it should be open. Um, and, and if not, there needs to be good reasons why not. This policy change is not occurring in a vacuum. Uh, for the past few decades now, there's been a movement towards more open access and towards more open data and open science um, in the uh, U.S. Uh, and internationally. So in the U.S., especially in the past few years, there have been big moves towards um, supporting open research through legislation. There have been reports from the Government Accountability Office about how much research should be made available. Um, both research findings and underlying data sh uh, uh, should be available, even though it's not. And um, UNESCO at the international level has been promoting uh, the use of open science for the uh, for what should be the standard practice across um, all scientific communities. A little bit of a timeline about the Nelson memo. Um, back in 2022 was when the Nelson memo was initially released. Um, and shortly thereafter, NIH released its draft plan for responding to that. They had been working towards these issues for several years leading up to it. Um, and so they didn't need too much time to release their, their draft plan um, last year. Uh, a couple of months after that, only 143 comments were written and submitted to NIH. And this represented a lot of organizations, of course. Um, but as I mentioned right at the beginning, this really represents uh, um, an opportunity for communities to get engaged uh, for how policy is created um, at the highest levels of, of government through sort of a, a coordinated effort to encourage best practice and encourage progressive steps towards more open access, towards more open data. Uh, just recently, this past month, NIH released its uh, revised plan based on the response to those 143 written comments. And so this is um, the period we're in right now. Uh, in just 12 days time, there's a deadline for responding to uh, what has just recently been released. And, and Katie will be sharing a link uh, again in a moment. Uh, what they've responded to so far, COS will be responding to it as well. Um, uh, uh, later next week. And uh, at the end of this year is when the, the final policy and the final implementation plan um, needs to be uh, written down and, and made available. And that will go into effect at the end of next year. So as I mentioned, this is the period we're in right now. Uh, they've uh, released a couple of drafts and received comments, and um, this is likely the final opportunity uh, for having your voice heard in the process. Uh, in a few minutes, I'll be sharing a, a, a direct link to this, and you'll receive it after the webinar as well. Uh, but this is what the uh, draft policy looks like. This is the website where um, information about the draft policy is available, and a written description of the uh, a written summary of the uh, opinions and and, and uh, submissions that were given last year to the NIH and their responses to, to those types of uh, comments and, and concerns that arose. So we'll be going through uh, what the policy looks like right now and our opinions about what, what more can and should be done uh, for making this the, the best policy possible in terms of open access and open science. For right now, I'm going to give the floor to Katie and I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can find the button. And Katie, would you be able and willing to share Spark's perspective on these topics? Yes. Let me share my screen.
Can you see that? That looks good to me. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. So thanks, David. Well, before um, I get into it, I did. I also always like to start um, all of my uh, kind of presentations with just a little bit of information about Spark. Uh, so we, if you don't know us already, we are a nonprofit advocacy organization. We represent college and university libraries across the U.S. and Canada. We have about uh, 250 members and we work to make research open and equitable. I lead our policy work on open education and open research. And as David mentioned, today I'm here to provide a little bit of uh, thoughts from Spark, our perspective on the draft NIH public access policy and the associated guidance, and then highlight some of our comments, um, some of the pieces of our comments uh, that we submitted actually yesterday afternoon uh, to the NIH RFI. And I'll put um, a link in the chat at the end uh, so you can look at our comments if those are of interest um, and reference those as you prepare your own or think about preparing your own. So I did uh, want to just start with uh, a couple kind of top line points about what the policy and the guidance actually says. So, you know, as expected, it removes the 12 month embargo. Um, this was a requirement of the Nelson Memorandum, as David said, but uh, NIH is the first agency to actually release a draft policy. We haven't seen any uh, from the others yet, although, as David said, they are uh, must submit their official policies or issue them by the end of this calendar year. So we expect to see more of those, but it removes the 12 month embargo. Um, you know, from our perspective, that's that's huge. Uh, a sea change as David said, and now uh, when this goes into effect, it's slated to go into effect for manuscripts being published on or after October 1st, 2025. Um, and now with that embargo lifted, researchers, patients, scientists, um, experts, the general public are finally going to have the latest information at their fingertips to be able to um, address, you know, the pressing challenges that we have from, you know, diabetes and cancer um, to other uh, health disparities as well. Uh, it also requires that the final peer-reviewed manuscript be submitted to PubMed Central immediately upon publication. Um, so it was always the requirement that it had to be submitted to PubMed Central, but now, of course, it's immediately upon publication with the embargo removed. Uh, the policy also reiterates that authors do not have to pay a fee to comply with the policy. Um, so in other words, you can comply by depositing the author's accepted manuscript into PubMed Central for free. That's really important, and I'll come back to that uh, when I talk about our comments. Uh, and then it also requires that grantees explicitly grant the NIH the right to make the manuscript available in PubMed Central without embargo. However, um, and this is an important piece, it does not explicitly grant full reuse rights of that publication to the public or of that manuscript to the public. I'm going to also talk a little bit more about that in, in our comments. And then I also wanted to... Um, dive a little bit deeper on one of the guidance pieces that was released um, accompanying the, the policy itself. And that guidance is on costs. So again, they re reiterate in this draft guidance that submission to PMC remains free. And then they say that any fee requested by a publisher for submission to PubMed Central is not an allowable cost. So in other words, you're not gonna be able to charge that cost to your NIH grant. And so an example of a publisher, you know, trying to uh, charge you a fee for, for depositing in PubMed Central, which is, is free. An example of that might be like an article development charge that um, we've seen, you know, some, some folks start to talk about for um, green open access or things like that. That's not going to be something that you can charge to your NIH grant. Uh, they also talk about other unallowable costs, so um, costs for which the institution already pays a fee that would cover the publication. This is um, in reference to read and publish agreements. So if your institution has a read and publish agreement in which authors at your institution are covered by that agreement and can, can publish without specifically paying a fee themselves because it's already covered by um, the agreement that your library has paid for, you can't then charge another fee uh, to the NIH grant for that. Um, they also uh, do not are, are not going to allow you to charge a fee if it's if you're being differentially charged because you're an NIH author and they know that you're subject to the policy. Uh, they don't want the kind of uh, NIH authors being treated differently because of this requirement. Um, and then also costs incurred after the closeout of the award. I know this was a question that some folks 
folks had, like if I publish after the award closes, um, you know, how do I pay for that? And they are saying that after the closeout, you cannot charge, you know, those uh, costs back to the grant. Uh, they also do talk about reasonable costs for publication, like an article processing charge being allowed, but they don't define what reasonable means. They do, however, uh, encourage grantees to consider the impact of what such a fee uh, may be on library and institutional budgets, um, other institutional or professional priorities for the researcher and those kinds of things. So uh, the areas of our feedback that I wanted to highlight are kind of in these four major areas. So as I mentioned um, before, the la there's language in the policy making it clear that grantees can comply can comply for free by depositing the author accepted manuscript into PubMed Central. Uh, we strongly support this language. We think it's really important. Um, although, you know, OSCP has made it uh, very clear in both public statements and in reports to Congress that you don't have to pay a fee to comply with um, any of the policies that are kind of come out from the Nelson memo. Certainly, we've observed that in some conversations, um, folks mistakenly uh, assume that the way to comply with these policies is going to be through gold open access or paying an APC, and that's simply not true. So we think um, this is really important that NIH says this in their policy, and we strongly support it, say that in our comments, and then also um, suggest that in addition to the policy, NIH continue to be really clear in all of their communications with institutions, grantees, authors, and the broader research community that you don't have to pay a fee to comply. We certainly don't want researchers facing any um, financial barriers to compliance or you know, paying an unnecessary fee that they don't have to pay, but they may just assume that they have to pay. So we think that's really important. Um, the other part is reuse of publications. So uh, this is an area that we think NIH can make some improvements from our perspective to their policy. Um, so as I said earlier, they do require that authors, when submitting something to PubMed Central, do ex explicitly authorize, uh, NI give NIH the rights to make the article available on PubMed Central with no embargo. But they don't specifically require that uh, reuse rights be given to the public to be able to fully use that article or publication after it's made available in PubMed Central. Um, they do rely on their government use or federal purpose license uh, to do this and to ask authors to give them these rights, which states that NIH reserves a royalty-free, non-exclusive, and irrevocable right to reproduce, publish, or otherwise use the work for federal purposes and to authorize others to do so. Again, we believe that they should explicitly authorize the public to fully reuse the publications. And this is key to really maximizing the return on the investment that Congress has made with our taxpayer dollars um, by uh, ensuring that the public cannot just read the publication, but can actually use all the other tools and secondary analysis that you would want to on an article uh, without the public having full reuse rights to the publications. Researchers and other, uh, other experts may have to pay additional licensing fees if they want to do text and data mining or you know, if they want to use other computational tools like artificial intelligence um, on these articles. And a very clear example of this was in um, the COVID-19 pandemic when um, or author publications, publishers lifted their paywalls on um, articles so that there was now this um, text in uh, text and data mining was available on all of these articles. Uh, full reuse rights were allowed, and there was this um, really robust database called the Core 19 database, which was a um, a partnership between NIH and the research community to allow um, all the secondary analysis to be done on all of these articles so that you could find um, patterns and you could, uh, amongst all the COVID-19 related research. And that was really critical to us being able to uh, come up with um, a vaccine, have treatments, and really expand our knowledge super quickly about this emerging virus. And so uh, that's an example of what we need to be doing, not just for COVID-19-related research, not just in a public emergency, but for all of the other um, public health issues facing us from diabetes and cancer um, to other things as well. So uh, 
again, we think that's really important and we'll be, we have made suggestions in our comments for how NIH can explicitly authorize the public, which they already have the authority to do under the federal purpose license, but they need to explicitly say that the public has reuse rights to these articles. Um, also, a uh, repository deposit beyond PubMed Central. Obviously, PubMed Central has been around for a long time. It's very robust, but you know, our perspective kind of broadly across all of the agency policies is that um, we don't want just one repository to be allowed for compliance. We would really like NIH to consider allowing for deposit in institutional repositories as long as they meet certain standards so that um, we have a kind of a diverse network of repositories, not just kind of a one a one uh, one to rule them all kind of approach. And you know that can help with compliance, easing burden for faculty because it's a local you know repository that then can be you know communicated to NIH that yes, this uh, article was put here, it meets the compliance. So we're encouraging NIH to think about that and engage with um, the US Repositories Network, which is a project of Spark. Uh, that's working to try and make the network of repositories in the U.S. more robust, more interoperable with one another and with the federal repositories as well. Um, and then the last thing is we also want to make sure that the policy and the guidance doesn't inadvertently undermine some of these emerging research communication models like diamond open access and preprints. So we are suggesting that NIH consider adding language that allows for costs that support these emerging models not just the models that produce, you know, a singular journal article. Um, we are concerned that as written, the current language may limit allowable costs to only those associated with APC-based models. And so we're suggesting NIH think about that and, and consider altering the language. So those are kind of the top issues that we have focused on um, in our uh, feedback. And I also just, you know, want to reiterate really the importance of that reuse piece um, and um, it's important that the public can't just read something, but they can actually do something with the article. Um, and again, as I said, the, the uh, COVID-19 example, I think, is just a really stark one, especially in the context of NIH, to see uh, what can actually be done and what was needed, frankly, in that emergency, and that we should be doing that um, for all other diseases and kind of national challenges that we face. I think with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, David, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Kate. That, that was really fantastic. Um, I couldn't agree more, frankly. I'll give a, the biggest plus one I can. Um, you sort of you imagine how much science, you know, took place and, and can, could take place um, with, with that amount of um, access to scientific findings being made available. There, there's just so much knowledge um, that we as a species um, conduct, and and um, there's so much knowledge that's uh, theoretically available, uh, but that's not as accessible as, as it could be. You know, um, of course, behind paywalls and file drawers and, and, and everywhere. Um, and I think that really gets to the core of why. Um, there's such a strong push towards open access, towards open data, towards open science in general, in that it um, really allows science to operate as um, as best as it possibly can. So, um, sorry if I'm getting a little bit emotional about it, but these are just really uh, kind of you know important issues. I'm going to reiterate a couple of points that you made, um, and I'm going to, although uh, frankly, I. Not, not do as well of a job as you did. Um, I'm going to point to some ways to that um, uh, audience members can uh, take a look and respond to these issues. I'm going to point out some of the um, topics that we at the Center for Open Science advocate for under the open data banner, which is a little bit of a side issue for the topic of the RFI that we're talking about today, but I'll, I'll point back to how it's relevant. Um, and there are several questions coming in. They're all great, so keep them coming. I think we'll have some time at the end to go through them. And we've got uh, um, some good answers and some terrible answers for those questions that are coming in. So um, you know, please put them in the box as you think of them. I'm going to share once more. All right. Uh, I'll try to go quickly through some of these points that were uh, 
mentioned initially, but ju just to emphasize the fact that um, there has been discussion, that, um, and this is one of the questions that was um, showing up in the chat. Um, there, there has been back and forth about um, a, a delay to this policy uh, for when it should go into effect. Um, so far, they, they've taken a look at those considerations and are still asserting that the um, uh, timeline is uh, will remain as follows. Um, and just in case you notice the slight discrepancy, um, it says October 1st, 2025, um, as opposed to December 2025. That's just um, uh, in order for it to uh, really take effect in, in time. That's when the expected um, enforcement date uh, could occur or, or will occur. The a couple of the comments that came through their last draft policy. Um, uh, I'm going to highlight a couple of these that uh, are are noteworthy for consideration and that might have areas for uh, further commenting. So they did take a good uh, job at defining what they mean by articles. Um, needing to be freely accessible. So in, in particular, they defined articles um, and uh, for the purpose of this policy, the manuscript that they're defining right here is what needs to be deposited and be made available through PMC. Um, and this is just the, the final version that the author created. And so that, that will be kind of in the Word doc or PDF format that the author created. Um, that's gone through um, likely a, a few rounds of peer review. And the last thing that they submit to the publisher, to the journal for publication before it goes through the, the um, copy editing and formatting process that the, that the journals will do. Um, that's, of course, the final published article. Um, and, and that, as a PDF, is um, not what's expected to be made publicly available necessarily. Um, I would say that the um, and Angie's doing a good job here defining what needs to be made available. Um, uh, but to echo K Katie's point, uh, more encouragement or definition about earlier versions or shared versions that are publicly available, aka preprints, um, providing guidance on um, how and when to to share that would would complement this policy and, and uh, help meet their goals even further. Um, the uh, uh, as Katie also mentioned, the the current license is a license that's being applied to the manuscript that's submitted to PMC um, is what's known as the government use license, um, and this is a okay license. Uh, it's basically saying that in order to meet the the goals of this policy, um, that being people should be able to to read it, and in particular, I think a good example of how some of these, um, the, the status quo is a little bit bonkers. Um, policymakers in, in Congress, uh, for example, cannot necessarily read the uh, you know, articles that you know, should be used as, as, as evidence for making the best policy possible. Um, and so obviously that's a clear government use that um, the manuscripts available through the government use license and PMC um, is helping to make um, but, but we would encourage, um, likewise, that um, broader licenses for, for more use would do more to accelerate science and to meet the um, spirit of the goals that are outlined in, in the Nelson memo. Um, and there are a couple of questions in the chat about you know, how much reuse, particularly commercial reuse, um, should be allowable there. And, and there is um, that is a, a, a good topic for conversation that we can get into a little bit more in the Q&A. Um, but there are several um, good open licenses that can um, be more or less open, more or less restrictive, depending on the um, appropriateness of the of the work. I want to point out a couple of other items um, in the, uh, particularly in, in, in the Nelson memo, uh, that are points that uh, we are looking for in these draft policies in order to make sure that they're being. Um, uh, appropriately implemented, um, and that uh, doesn't have to do with the, the manuscript that's being shared as, as open access, but it's uh, pointing to the uh, underlying data that's being generated as part of these federally funded grants. Um, in particular, um, we're looking for policies that uh, really take this definition from the Nelson memo and 
uh, and use it fully. So they're defining scientific data um, as um, um, items that are underlying the peer-reviewed scholarly publications. And they're specifically defining that as recorded factual information um, that's sufficient for validating and replicating research findings. So that these go beyond just an Excel spreadsheet with the kind of um, uh, measures for, from each cell, for example. This gets into things like protocols and stimuli, um, a good code book or, or strong metadata that really you know, tells you what's going on from, from each observation. And this is a very holistic and I would say appropriate definition of what um, needs to be shared in order to um, satisfy the um, you know, all the potential benefits that open science has to offer. Um, and so we're on the lookout for policies that articulate that particularly well. Um, and that's not the purpose of this specific request for information, but I'll, I'll be pointing to some examples of um, where that is or is not following through. Um, in, in particular, we're looking for um, policies that have strong guidance on how to um, create and share data management plans. Um, so we're looking for policies that include those uh, plans as part of the scored grant criteria. We're looking for them themselves to be publicly available because they're not intellectual property. It's, it's really just a statement of where the data is going to be deposited and when. We encourage the use of structured templates in this process so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel with a, with a beautiful narrative each time. Um, but it really you know, can and should just be a kind of a plug and play. This is where the data is going to be at this time, including this type of information. Um, the ability for them to be updated is, is critical because um, a, a static document um, isn't going to resolve to the final DOI where you deposit the data. Um, unless, of course, that is um, updated. And so being able to update that um, really, uh, sorry to use a cliche, but it closes the loop in terms of um, satisfying the promise that was given early on in a, in a research plan. And then, as I just um, pointed out before, uh, we want to make sure that the guidance really articulates the definition that the federal government has asserted. Um, that that data it includes um, all the digital materials that are needed to validate and replicate research findings. Um, some agency plans have been coming out over the past um, months and, and few years. Um, some of those are at various stages of draft or or they're all draft, of course, until they're finalized. Um, but uh, some of them are more fully articulated than others. Um, we've been looking at those based on the criteria that I uh, just went over. Um, and so far, you know, some of them are, are, are including good definitions and good criteria, um, but none that we've seen so far are really pointing towards publicly available data management plans. Um, a, a minority of them are saying that these will be part of the reviewed criteria. Uh, four of the nine that we've looked at really did a good job of defining what data um, should be defined as. Um, lastly, I'm going to give an overview of what this commenting process looks like. It's very straightforward. And as I've said two or three times now, um, I hope that a majority of the participants in this webinar take a look at this um, RFI process. And if you have strong opinions or if you have moderate opinions, um, take the opportunity to uh, make your voice heard. Uh, you know, think about um, how expansively research outputs should be made available for scientific advancement. Um, think about ways that preprints and or diamond, ac diamond open access journals should be supported, um, and not to the exclusion of, of other venues. And of those topics that you have an opinion on, uh, take a short amount of time to let your opinion be heard. Um, as I've again said a few times, uh, fewer than 200 responses come to this. And so having your voice heard in this process is a, a, a real clear step that we can take to sort of make sure that um, those who are funding science are really putting policies in place that make it as good as possible. 
So this comment form is very straightforward, putting in your name and you can um, respond on your own, kind of as a, a personal um, a, you know, a, a, a opinion. Uh, if you're a, a researcher, if you're a faculty member and you're speaking just on your um, on your own behalf, go ahead and, and say that. If you're, uh, of course, uh, uh, in a leadership role in an organization, um, you know, make sure you have the right opinion. You should go ahead and uh, speak on behalf of that organization if you are empowered to do so. Um, and having those organizational voices really helps uh, make these opinions heard. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, a couple of different areas where you can um, select your your role and and how your uh, how you, you want to present yourself um, in part of this process. And for the purposes of this RFI, it's it's extremely straightforward. It's three specific questions um, about your comments on the draft uh, public access policy. Um, any opinions that you have about the um, government use license and rights, whether uh, you, you think other licenses you know, should be available or should be encouraged or perhaps required. Um, and if you have any um, opinions you'd like to share about the publication costs um, and how those should be uh, dealt with, uh, there's a, a field for you to comment on there. Um, Katie, I know you're going to share yours, um, probably by the end of this. So, um, I'll let you do that also. Um, but I'll also say that our responses, um, these RFIs go on our website on the Center for Open Science website for, uh, on the policy reform page. There are links to various activities that we have, um, and, and links to the, um, a small database of RFI responses that are going out. Yep, and I uh, put mine in the chat already. Yeah, put yours in the chat. And I'm going to also put in the chat a link to my slides. I think, Katie, if you want to share your slides, I can um, store those yep. for you. Or the, you're the real meat of what you, uh, I think, just shared is, is the um, RFI that's already been submitted. So that's probably the most important piece of information. But otherwise, um, I'll update these slides with links to anything else that is relevant so that people can get to it. For now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll um, go to the Q&A portion. Got a fair number. I saw some of these come through, but I wasn't paying attention in the last few minutes. Um, for okay, I'm going to go from what's on my top. Are there any protections for authors' work where AI is concerned? Um, I I do not know is the short answer. <laughs> the slightly long answer is that NIH just recently, and I haven't gone through uh, much of this because it um, I it just came through my inbox. I think yesterday, the day before, but um, NIH did uh, put out uh, a resource page for. Um, AI issues. So I would say start that, start looking um, for information that's relevant to what you're concerned about um, on that page. Mm -hmm. And I do suspect that over time, they'll, they, they would likely have RFIs for how to deal with um, the myriad of issues that arise um, when talking about um, AI. I know a lot of the issues are kind of around um, you know, AI generated work. But also, and I think I saw this early in some of the questions, um, work that we as researchers are generating being used for um, to train AI models. And so the implications of that are vast. Katie, yes. do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, to your point, I think it's a huge, huge question. Um, and yeah, to your, I don't believe uh, it's not my understanding that there are protections for AI uses of the work. Um, I think this really gets to the conversation about what should be uh, public policy for research that is funded by taxpayer dollars. What should you be able to do with it? And then, um, you know, what is an author's choice, which is also, I think, extremely important, um, you know, from my perspective in terms of what the public policy standpoint should be, you know, while I don't love that 
yes, under full reuse rights uh, for a publication that somebody could uh, bundle that together and kind of sell it for commercial use um, in, in cases that maybe aren't uh, great for authors. You know, authors aren't seeing a payment for that. Um, authors aren't seeing a payment for um, anyway in the publishing process now. Scientific authors are not being paid for their peer review or paid to publish now anyway. Um, but when we're talking about public dollar investment, one of the things we talk about is this research being able to spur business development, being able to be used to make an economic impact. So the policy position, um, I think maybe maybe one thing, and the full reuse of that from our perspective is important, but authors should also be able, um, just in general, you know, when they're not doing research that's funded by taxpayer dollars to make those decisions and education about, you know, what rights researchers have in the bundle of rights that you have before you give them away is totally within your control. And I think that's a really important part of this conversation, but I, it's all emerging and kind of changing day to day by day. I hadn't seen that NIH um, policy uh, link that you put in David. So that's really helpful. And I'm going to take a look at that. Yeah. I, I um, just came across it. Um, I'm not sure if it was yesterday or the day before, um, and I haven't seen kind of what their statements on it are so far. Um, but I, I think it touches on the themes you mentioned. Um, th this also gets to the the very next question. Uh, I think you've basically answered it already, but I'll just um, uh, give a little perspective from 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 my point of view. Um, you know, a lot of my salary is covered by uh, your private and uh, public dollars and um the, the the work that we generate at the center for urban science is um designed to be maximally reused for as many purposes as, as possible so as a default um what we do and this is more of a leading by example as opposed to a strong advocacy position um but putting everything out with sort of maximum reuse rights is a, a standard that we encourage others to to try to emulate um, especially if they're in a position where their salaries are are covered through um, any any amount of public dollars, um, you know the the most expansive is putting it into the public domain, so called CC zero. Um, the, the the next most expansive would probably be the Creative Commons um, by attribution, so CC by. Uh, but there there are other licenses such as the CC by with um, exclusions for non-commercial um, or exclusions for commercial reuse, <laughs> or rather um, CC by NC, I think is the um, abbreviation. And those are the types of licenses that um, we, we would also you know encourage NIH to consider as um, perhaps not requirements, but in encourage um, authors to consider as they're putting their work up for, for public benefit. I think that's all I have to say on that. The, the next one, uh, what happens with co-funded articles when another funder allows different business models than NIH um, in its, um, uh, for its draft that the authors preferred? My understanding is that any amount of the work was supported by NIH, then this NIH policy applies. Um, and so if there's a, if the other funder um, doesn't require this or w would be a, you know, fine with not um, posting to PMC, that can't be used as an excuse to not post to PMC. Um, Katie, is that your understanding or do you want to add anything? Yep, that's my understanding as well. Yep. Uh, Virginia asks, is the NIH or the government effort facing pushback from those who want to monetize research? Um, all of the comments that were submitted to the last RFI are available. I was just speaking with Katie ahead of time. I, I saw her response to the previous one. Um, and so there's a, a link to those um, from the RFI page uh, that we're talking about today. There's, there's a link to previous comments. So I'm not going to speak on behalf or... Um, try to summarize what other comments uh, arose from that process. I'll just say that that their public positions are publicly available. So um, 
you know, go take a look. And it's even, there's a table of contents in that big document. Uh, so you can, you know, click through to see um, any organization's response and, and, and what their opinions are. Mm -hmm. so that's all I'll say. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bonnie Nelson asks, so currently the intent is that every NEH-funded manuscript will be deposited in PMC. It wouldn't just be one avenue um, of being openly accessible. Katie, so like if they publish open access, um, yeah, it they're still expected. Right. It has to be made. It has to be made available into PubMed Central. Now there are, um, you know, some publishers have historically before the embargo was changed, you know, had an agreement with NIH to deposit for the author the uh, version of record and that is still a compliance option that folks can use if you want if if and I if the publisher has an agreement with the National Library of Medicine to do so um they'll you know it's relying on them to make sure it gets into PubMed Central but um, those are the two avenues so submitting to a publisher that has an agreement with NIH to put it there for you or submitting it yourself to PubMed Central Um, good. Let's see. Um, uh, Morana asks, costs for publications are treated as direct costs by federal agencies. If a library signs an open access agreement, or if they're investing in a diamond support, could those costs be treated as indirect costs? Is someone else, it, is someone somewhere trying to justify that to their institution? I don't know. I can <laughs> try and yeah, well, uh, thanks for the question, Moriana. It's good to hear from you. That's a great question. Um, I, I can I can just say I, I don't think this has been explored that much. Yeah. Um, my understanding of indirect costs is that you know, each institution has an indirect cost rate that is negotiated with the agents between the agency and the institution every I don't know if it's two to five years, something like that. And every negotiation, it has like a ton of costs that they're trying to think about. I think it's an interesting um, thing to potentially explore. You know, I think with there's been some conversations of should an APC cost be an indirect cost. I would have personally some concerns with kind of the runaway nature of article processing charges that we've already seen, you know, increase and having that. Um, be something that's only negotiate the rate being something that's only negotiated every um, you know five years or so. I think it would make the APC cost a little more opaque and harder. And institutions may end up you know getting themselves in a situation or the agency actually by agreeing to an indirect cost rate that's you know not really reflective of the APC cost. The diamond um, one may be more easy to. Kind of plan for just because it's not you know a commercial um entity but so i think those are still being explored but it's a good point uh to bring up and one we should perhaps you know i'll talk about a little more on the diamond front in particular good point um all right a couple of good points mentioned i'm going between a couple of different things um let's see uh, I've lost track a little bit. I'm, um, I'm going to ask and read the question about compliance, and then I'll go back to the Q&A panel here. Um, will the NIH or other funders confirm how they plan to carry out compliance checks and what the implications of non-compliance are? So my understanding is that uh, compliance is, is being treated the same for articles, for data, um, that uh, future funding could be uh, not allowed could be I'm not sure what the word that's not revoked, but could be at, at risk right. um, uh, for failure to comply with this public access policy or for the um, finalized uh, uh, open data policy. Um, I think it remains to be seen how strongly it will be in enforced. Um, but as of right now, that's my understanding. Katie, do you have? Yeah, that's my understanding too. They'll look at um, you know your the closeout of your last grant and see if you have met all the compliance requirements. There may be some specific kind of like you know software or something that NIH uses that I I'm not super familiar with on their current compliance checks. Um, but yeah, I think through their internal system, 
how they manage grants and they have grant IDs, you know, that's how they will monitor. Right. Um, how yeah. And I believe that the um, institutions will be um, probably the, the most um, focus <laughs> of enforcement expectations. So, um, you know, a, a researcher works for the, for the institution and the institution is the entity that's responsible for um, fulfilling the obligations of the grant agreement, essentially. Yes. Oh, here's a, a good question. Um, can you give examples of things you think the public should be able to do with the published research that they can't do um, sort of under the status quo or under um, free to read after embargo? Um, uh, Katie, you're, you're uh, giving some examples earlier, but it, it really comes down to how um, efficiently these ideally machine readable um, research findings are able to be accessed, um, compiled into, uh, into new knowledge and connections can be made from one individual research finding to the, the, the millions of you know, other pieces of empirical evidence that are being generated on an annual basis. So it's, it's essentially a matter of um, machine readability and efficiency, and then using that for the, the public good um, and, uh, you know, commercial well-being is one of the um, factors that are considered in that sort of public good uh, domain as well. Do you want to add anything else to that? Uh, just that, you know, I mentioned the um, CORD-19 database example um, when I was giving my remarks. And, yeah. and that, I mean, I, I just think that's a really stark example. So in, in that situation, the articles related to COVID-19 or coronavirus in general were able to be put into a machine-readable database. Um, a combination of full text and citations that linked out to other things, but the full text corpus that was able to be text and data mined and having AI tools used on it allowed researchers in real time to make connections uh, across thousands of articles at one time to quickly find the information they needed. And there's a lot of examples of like word association that was able to be used in that secondary analysis that the majority of the articles without uh, kind of lifting, both lifting the paywall and also um, having a, a broad reuse license associated with them would not have been possible before that. So they actually publishers and, you know, in working with NIH allowed for reuse in that case, because they were asked, you know, by the community and by the White House to lift their paywalls and allow for reuse. Um, and that was a really critical example. And that wouldn't be, they couldn't have done that um, under the current uh, license. And the current license being the, sorry, the standard government reuse license that's applied to manuscripts that are uploaded to PMC? Um, I, th I think that the government, I mean, the government use license does provide the government with the authority to authorize the public to do to you to do full reuse. Um, it's a matter of, I think, the government uh, leveraging that and actually authorizing the public to 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 do, do that. that in on the manuscripts that are made available in PubMed Central. Um, as I said before, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the things in PubMed Central are versions of record, and those do not have the uh, reuse rights that are available in others. And in this case, they were, um, and and to be used in the Core nineteen database. So that's right. just, and and some of them have been repaywalled, or some of them have do not have the full reuse rights that they had at the time. Um, so that's just a, a an example of what can happen when we do have full reuse rights. Um, and, and Allison is um, making a comment that uh, that's not necessarily that's not public reuse. That's other researchers with specialized skills reusing the content. Um, that's it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think of the public being a, a everyone personally, you know, including researchers, researchers. And, experts and everything else. And um, you know, I from my perspective, I don't think we want to limit who gets to do that. Um, 
because it can it can stifle innovation and and those kinds of things. Yeah. Um. Well, the supplemental material uh, part of the article fall under this policy. What about supplemental data? Um, and will that be licensed to be mined and, and um, publicly reused? Uh, so my understanding is that supplemental material will fall under the, the data policy, the NIH's data policy um, that uh, does require data deposition um, when it's um, ethically and logistically feasible to do so. Um, what I don't know, and Katie, maybe you'll have a uh, more knowledge on this or uh, understanding, is that uh, would data deposited as supplemental data, I, I don't believe that, um, my opinion is that it shouldn't <laughs> uh, count as proper data sharing because it's not going in a, in a repository where it's um, linked with you know other similar uh, reusable data. Um, and, and I don't believe that PNC is, is a data repository or, or a setup for the supplemental data issues. Do, do you have any other insights into that? I think that's right. I think uh, on publications, the policy and kind of what they've current practice has been that you've got to make it available in PubMed Central. The data repository piece, they have um, a variety of characteristics that they want repositories that you put your data into to, to meet. Um, so the desirable characteristics of data repositories is a document that OSCP um, worked on and put out, and that's what they refer to as wanting um, researchers to make sure their uh, repositories match those uh, characteristics. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a comment here, um, and, and this is uh, my fault, I guess. I, I was going into some of the data policies and positions of advocacy, not just for NIH, but more, more broadly. Um, so just as a reminder, the, the NIH data policy um, is included um, at this link. And so um, please go there just to see what that says, um, regardless of any um, uh, other opinions that, that I shared or anything like that. Uh, oh, and Stacy, thank you for sharing supplemental materials policy. Uh, so if anybody's interested in that, please follow that link to see how that is um, handled there. And then I think the last question, I think we've got time just for this last one. Um, is it the case that the draft NIH policy allows um, derivative works without author permission? Um, yes, is the short answer. It allows for, it, it, it's currently falling under the, the government reuse license. And, and as you um, just articulated, um, that allows anybody to read it and allows the government to authorize um, uses of it. it. It doesn't require um, author permission for that to happen, uh, but it doesn't happen on a broad across the board basis uh, as a regular occurrence. Yeah, and I um, what we are suggesting when we say the NIH should explicitly authorize the public to fully reuse the articles, the language we are recommending says so long as attribution is given to the author. So that's our position. So I think that's the, that attribution piece is really important. And Creative Commons licenses always require attribution to the author as well, although we are not you know directly suggesting the use of a Creative Commons license. We want essentially a functional equivalent of that. Um, and we want authors to um, get at, get be credited and have attribution. That is I can a answer, good, fair I, point. Yes. I mm -hmm. think there was a question about AI indexing and a reference um, about Sparks. Oh my gosh. That. Yes. Uh, I'm, ha I, I'm happy to address what I, th I think the person is trying to ask. I think you're, they're referencing an article on the Taylor and Francis, I think selling um articles to Microsoft AI and others and frustrations there. Um, as I said before, you know, there's um a position on 
what public policy should be with publicly funded research. And then I think there's kind of a separate but related conversation to the rights that authors should have. And if you're not subject to a, a policy because you're not funded by public dollars and you don't want your research to be used for AI indexing or anything else, um, then you should be able to make that choice. Because again, you as the author, you hold the rights up until you sign them away. And whether it be, um, you know, a publisher selling your article to a company um, or something else, you should be able to, um, you know, control how that works. And I'll also say, you know, the OSCP memo is very clear that nothing in it should undermine copyright. Mm -hmm. um, it does not try and force authors where they should publish or anything else um, like that. So I think it's a really important uh, point to make. And I apologize. Yeah, there were several questions that were uh, beyond the... Uh... The little window that I had opened up um, in the corner there. So I apologize. We are out of time. Um, thank you, everybody, for participating, for, for just being here um, and for submitting your questions. If um, Katie, as always, thank you for being a font of knowledge. Um, thank you for the work that you do to advocate um, on these issues. And uh, I appreciate everybody that's um, that's here today. Thank you very much.